Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Scott. Hey, All Scott. right. You, we gave these guys microphones. We're in trouble. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to 45 minutes of talking about the financial services journey to the cloud. That's what we're talking about, right? Cloud journey and financial services. And I don't know about you guys, but when I think of the word journey, I think many people sometimes think of the Lord of the Rings where they had to go on that really long trek to get somewhere. I don't think that's the right application of the word journey when it comes to cloud adoption. I much prefer to think about one of those scenes from the Rocky movies. There's always a training montage where Rocky has to get ready for that next fight. That's what I really think the journey to the cloud is. And so if you came expecting a story about taking a long path to get somewhere, you might be disappointed about, about the next 45 minutes. But if you came to understand how the industry is preparing itself for that next fight, for the next iteration of technology, and how people are preparing for that, then I think you're in for a treat because we've got two organizations on stage with me who are doing just that, who are leveraging the cloud in meaningful ways uh, in their organizations. Um, so let me introduce those two folks to you right now. Uh, to my immediate right, we've got Rob Palatnik, the Chief Architect at DTCC. I'll let him introduce himself uh, more in depth in a minute. And to his right, we've got uh, Bob uh, Krecknell from Refinitiv, uh, and he is the, their sales director here uh, in ASEAN. So before I get started, let me let you guys um, very quickly uh, say a little bit more about yourselves, your company, uh, and we'll start with that. Sure. I just, uh, Rob Palatnik, Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. Uh, we're a global financial services organization in the United States. We are the primary clearing or and settlement organization for basically all stock market trades and bond market trades. And we provide a variety of different global services uh, in uh, the swap market and another part of pre and post trade processing. Thanks, Rob. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bob Cracknell. Uh, I work at uh, Refinitiv. Uh, interested to see a show of hands from the room who knows uh, who Refinitiv is. There's a few uh, hands there. All the Refinitiv um, employees are not, are not allowed. <laughs> for, to any, uh, for, for those doubters in the room, um, Refinitiv is uh, the business formerly known as uh, Thomson Reuters Financial and Risk. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I lead our business here in ASEAN um, and wear a number of different hats uh, for our technology solutions. Uh, Refinitiv is a global six billion dollar business, uh, the largest provider of financial information services uh, to the global industry um, and cloud is an important and exciting part of our strategy going forward. So Bob, let's stay with you for a minute um, and I'd love to know uh, what number one Refinitiv is doing in the cloud today um, and then also what you think some of the key trends are uh, in the industry in the adoption of this technology. Sure. Um, so, you know, I won't go through the uh, the, the, the long history of uh, cloud adoption uh, in the spirit of Rocky. Um, as you said, what we've seen in the industry is a lot of um, firms uh, really focusing on cost, um, and you know that, that's been an important part of our journey. Um, so, really, we've had two kind of elements to our cloud strategy. One is uh, engaging with our internal systems, our internal uh, platforms and processes, and abstracting those to the cloud and that work has been ongoing for a long time um, and continues. Um, but uh, perhaps more importantly um, for, for people at this event is uh, the work that we're doing around uh, uh, exposing our platforms and services, our solutions to our customers um, as uh, cloud native solutions. Um, so we have a wide variety of platforms, um, and a whole number of projects including uh, some exciting work we've been doing with AWS. We announced um, earlier this year uh, the launch of our Electron real-time data feed platform in AWS. That's a, um, a market data service delivering streaming data in the cloud um, to uh, thousands of uh, consuming applications um, and uh, covering uh, tens and tens of millions of financial instruments. So uh, exciting work happening there. Um, in terms of trends, uh, I jotted a few notes down, so um, here goes. I, I mentioned cost, right? That's no, um, no stranger to the room. Everybody's focused on how can they 
leverage cloud much more effectively to uh, rip cost out of the business. But what I think we're seeing um, certainly this year is much more focus on firms um, adopting cloud technologies to drive revenue growth. Uh, and, uh, um, and there's a number of use cases there that I can talk about a bit, a bit later. But I think the, the desire to really get hold of the agility that cloud offers, the ability to spin environments up quickly, tear them down quickly, um, the ability to scale massively. We're a data company, um, and so content is um, at the heart of everything our customers do. And so for them to be able to use cloud technologies to exploit that elastic compute is uh, very, very powerful. Um, I also think that we've seen a trend of a real ecosystem developing around the cloud. Uh, if you looked at a lot of cloud platforms um, a couple of years ago, or even a year ago, um, really the focus really was around compute and storage. Um, and I think what we're seeing now is real marketplaces developing, um, lots of common standards developing, uh, including uh, the use of lots of tools around AI and machine learning, which I know has been a big uh, source of discussion in this conference. Um, and as a data company, that's exciting for us to see people consuming more uh, into uh, innovative ways of using our data. So a lot to unpack there, and we'll, we'll come back to some of those themes that you mentioned uh, a little bit later. But uh, Rob, I want to turn to you and ask you the same question to get started. Um, how is DTCC using the cloud today and you have a, 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 an equally unique position uh, as Refinitiv in that you get to see across the market um, and speak to a lot of different uh, financial institutions about what they're doing. Uh, what are you guys doing in the cloud today and what are the trends that you're seeing in cloud adoption? Sure. Um, first, first, I actually have a question for the, the audience because both of my peers on this panel brought up uh, Rocky. How many people have actually seen the movie Rocky? Oh, look. Oh, look at that. Look All, at right. That. All right. So you, so you know what that journey is. It's, it's, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. That's we had the music keyed up for, for, <laughs> for uh, this particular moment, but we cut it from the Is budget. that your entry music, yes. Rocky? All right. So now you'll know when you hear that song, Scott's coming in. Um, so DTCC uh, sits in the middle of the financial industry. Uh, and we're dependent on every single day to make sure that in, in the financial markets globally, and in particular in the United States stock and equity, mar uh, equity and fixed income markets, that trades settle, that every single day, every trade gets, that's settled, every person who sold a security gets his money, everyone who bought a security gets a security, never missing a day, never not processing, never not completing on time, meeting all our regulatory requirements. So we, we occupy a position in the industry where we've been doing something for 50 years and everyone in the financial industry just expects DTCC to process every minute of every day. So when we start messing with that model, we basically wake up all the risk functions, all the groups that are concerned about violating some regulatory threshold, so our cloud journey actually started with a project to report. Uh, our first project, we were asked to do something with public data. We were asked to make swap transactions, something called derivative transactions, pricing data public. And it hadn't been public before, and we were told to make it public on the internet. Our internal team came up with a $6 million, $8 million Singapore dollar estimate of how to build it. Um, so we, we literally had a couple of guys on our team say, that sounds like a lot. I've heard about this thing called Amazon. Let me see if I can do something in Amazon and be able to give our business partners a better financial number. So literally they went home over the weekend and we had skeptical programmers. And I don't, I don't know what types of organization you all work for, but in, in a legacy organization that's been around a long time, there's a lot of skepticism of anything new. Everyone is a, there's a strong culture around, this is what got us to today, this is what's worked yesterday, this is what's gonna to work tomorrow. So you've really gotta be able to prove you have a better idea if you're going to sell it to, to all the skeptics. So literally over a weekend, we, they were able to get a prototype running and a demonstration. We had a $6 million estimate at the beginning of the project. At the end of the year, we were live, so we started in April. By, by December, we were live, uh, and the first bill came in, I think it was $2,500 a month 
uh, and by the end of the year, we, the bill was close to $30,000 in Amazon costs for a project that was originally estimated at $6 million. So the business, like, jaws dropped, and it was, how can we do more with this? So within a year, we were moving data projects to the cloud. Um, we've we've uh, created a bunch of data warehouse and data mark pipeline, starting small, but just getting bigger and bigger. Uh, and really, our journey has been uh, kind of a doubling. Every year, we put double what we did the previous year into the cloud. We're now right at the threshold of figuring out how to make critical transaction processing systems work in the cloud. And that's where our, our, our regulatory supervisors really wake up. They want to make sure that if we're processing transactions and we're processing transactions for the financial community, that security is there, that privacy is there, that resiliency is there. If their system goes down, it just keeps going. There's no such thing as going down. Um, so we're working through all of that in close partnership with AWS. If I look at trends, um, I, I, I see an interesting trend. I see where I go to some meetings and there's a group of, of um, people we're meeting with that will say, everyone's in the cloud, why are we even talking about this as something new? And then I'll talk to the rest of the people in the room, usually the other 99 people, if there are 100 people in the room, one person saying everyone's in the cloud, the other 99 are saying the regulators won't let me go to the cloud. That there are privacy issues, there are security issues, the regulators want to go into a data center and see the blinking lights on the machines, even if that doesn't matter anymore. Those are just little gadgets you get that blink lights to make regulators happy. No, have any regulators in the room? <laughs> Did I just, just ex expose a giant secret we have of the financial the industry? Um, so working through that in close partnership with our regulators, in close partnership with our, with our vendor, and making sure that everything works in every case so that you know, we can start moving the conversation away from anecdote about what won't be allowed and what is allowed, but that we are doing the full risk consideration that we have an exit strategy, that all the issues that the community is concerned about is addressed in a way that everyone is comfortable and actually even more confident that the data and, and that our systems can run even more reliably in the cloud. Thank you both. So let's take, a, let's take a second and let's actually see how right you guys were. Let's go to the audience. So we talked about some trends in cloud adoption. Um, show of hands, this is audience participation time. Who is actually using the cloud in, in your firm today? A show of hands. Okay, we've got... Uh, more people saw Rocky. Okay, more people saw Rocky than they're using the cloud today. All right, so put your hands down today. Um, so about, what, two-thirds of the audience? Am I being generous? Yeah. Half, half the audience is using cloud today. Okay, again, audience participation. Who works for a startup in the audience? And if you work for a startup, are you, are you, keep your hands up. Are you using the cloud? Okay, so one startup is using the cloud. All right, so if you, who in the audience works for an enterprise financial institution? What do the rest of you guys do? <laughs> That's the real question. Okay, for the, for the enterprises, hands up. Who's using the cloud today? Okay, just, just a handful, okay. So we have, a, we have a mixed audience. We've got some folks that work in enterprise financial institutions, some that work in startups, some we have no idea what they do. We should dig into that later. And then we have a mixed bag of folks that are using the cloud, which is probably a really good indicator of where the industry is today. Uh, and you guys did a great job of outlining um, really what some of those uh, early trends are, which are cost. People tend to look at cloud as cost takeout early on. But then what we've seen at AWS is we talk to customers more and more uh, and work with them more deeply, it tends to become a conversation about the business benefit, the agility you can get out of using these new tools and really what is a new financial world. And so I'd like to maybe focus there a little bit more for a second and go back to you, Bob, because you mentioned specifically the ability to generate new revenue streams. I imagine that probably has a little bit to do with, with agility. Um, and you mentioned the fact that you've got real-time data now in the cloud. What does that mean to, first and foremost, Refinitiv, being able to be more agile in product development, but even more importantly, what does it mean to your customers? Well, the agility on our side to be able to develop um, uh, capability more quickly is obvious. Uh, the, the faster we can bring uh, uh, product to market and deliver it through cloud providers who touch every corner of the financial market is, uh, is a huge win for us. 
but um, delivery of our content and, and our software platforms um, uh, as cloud solutions to customers enables customers to really um, leverage uh, the powerful capabilities that come resident in the cloud. So an example might be we've seen a rise of uh, use cases around quant um, uh, use cases where our customers buy side and sell side are taking vast amounts of data, they need to analyze that data really quick, they need to mix that data up with internal data, they want to overlay things like sentiment analysis with price time series data, look for trade signals in the market. And to do that, you need a huge amount of compute power, you need industry standard APIs, um, and you need to be able to use some of the toolkits that are increasingly available in the cloud, whether those are machine learning tools, whether those are open source analytic libraries, or proprietary libraries that people like us have also put up there. So I think it's about time to market and speed. Um, the quant use case is interesting because a quant typically isn't going to invest vast amounts of data, uh, sorry, vast amounts of money in um, exploring a data strategy um, if they've just got to turn it off pretty quickly, right? So people want to spin environments up, analyze data, um, perfect their trading strategies, um, kill the ones that aren't working and move forward with the ones that are. Um, the real-time use cases um, where customers are driving revenue streams relate more to um, those customers where uh, they need time to market. So they want to deliver streaming data, whether it's stocks or foreign exchange prices um, or other commodities, whatever the data might be, um, to their customers for price discovery. Um, and they need to connect really quickly and get that up and running. Um, the AWS instance that we have of our real-time feed, um, a brand new user who's never used our APIs before, not familiar with our data model, can spin up uh, an AMI and get access to a stream within two minutes uh, and connect an application. So we've had a lot of uh, use cases where customers are really getting access to that data quickly. And that gives them first mover advantage, can release services quicker um, and connect to their customers more quickly. So uh, Bob, out of curiosity, if I wanted access to real-time data as a customer uh, of Refinitiv and I didn't do it through the cloud, how long would it take me to get access to real-time data? Well, typically, if you didn't do it in the cloud, you would need to procure circuits. There can be lead times just on, uh, on doing that. Um, purchasing hardware, um, going through your internal IT and procurement processes to do that, hardening the equipment, installing software, um, uh, and then coding to an API that's a proprietary API. It can take many, many weeks um, to get to that stage um, of getting your application live. And I'm probably being generous there. Um, to, uh, to, to some of the developers. So you're talking many weeks down to minutes. Yeah, so a real, a real um, picture of, of the agility that's, that's available to customers. I want to stay with you for a minute because um, uh, I have always said that if you want uh, a litmus test on where cloud adoption is in the industry, look at the solution providers, those key solution providers uh, in the industry that we rely on to actually make the industry go and obviously refinitive of the services that you provide are one of those key solution providers. What are your customers telling you that they need? What's, what is making this um, transformation happen within the industry uh, with the adoption of cloud and now the need for real-time data, where as opposed to just a couple of years ago, it was just historical tick databases, now we're moving to real-time data. What's, what's driving that? Well, I think you're seeing so much disruption in the financial markets, um, both in terms of solution providers bringing new technologies and new capabilities to market, but also the markets themselves, the fabric of the markets and the participants in the market are changing uh, an unprecedented rate, and that creates a huge, um, uh, hugely competitive landscape that's more aggressive uh, than we've ever seen, with margins compress compressing very quickly. And you can, there's only so far you can go down the route of chasing down cost, um, and cost takeout will obviously deliver margin improvement, you've got to focus on, on, on delivery uh, of new revenue streams. So um, for our customers, they want us to be able to enable them to move quicker and ultimately to differentiate. Um, if you're able to evaluate a new exciting data set really quickly, develop a new trading algorithm or a new, new portfolio management strategy, 
based on that data, and you can move quicker than someone else, you can stay in the game longer, you make more money. So Rob, a little bit of, of a different market position for DTCC than say a Refinitive. Um, when you think about the value of agility and the transformation that you're trying to enact at DTCC, what, what comes to mind to you is, is the real value of being able to be more agile in the way you're developing? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to keep to the theme because uh, I, could, I think of uh, briefly three, three fail-fast stories or, or three quick-to-market stories where it either worked or it didn't. Uh, we had a quant uh, data analytics project. Uh, it was unstructured data, so we stood up a Hadoop cluster. Um, we were able to stand it up from the beginning of the project to actually standing it up with the technology in the marketplace in Amazon in two weeks. So in two weeks, we're able to test a very large data set. We got some performance numbers. We were running, I think, a 16 core instance. So the business said, well, let's see if we can make it go faster. So we stood up a 32 core instance. It took us about 10 minutes to go to a different size machine. How about 64? How about 128? So we just kept doubling the size of the machine. We were able to do uh, a complete proof of concept then turn it all off and throw the data away, literally within a month. If we had done that project in the traditional way, first we would have gone through a whole procurement. It would have taken six months just to get the first piece of equipment in the door. Uh, so, massive fail, uh, ability to try something out, succeed or fail. We ended up not going down the path because we couldn't prove out the business case. But we were able to get there really quickly. Second, something we just announced uh, recently, uh, was uh, a performance benchmark uh, uh, on two distributed ledger platforms. We did it all inside of Amazon. We were able to stand up two completely distributed, uh, two completely separate vendor distributed ledger networks over 350 nodes on each network. And we were able to stand it up, run it each day, and turn it off. Uh, and I, I can't even imagine how much it would have cost if we had to do that ourselves. And the last one is we did uh, a proof of concept with the industry on a di distributed ledger, ledger solution that's actually going to go to production in 2019. We did that original proof of concept with the entire industry in Amazon. We are able to stand that up and create interactions with the community with basically no need to change any rules or firewall rules or anything in our internal network. We turned the whole thing on externally. We created a separate sandbox, separate connections to different firms, separate security model, completely outside of our, our production, even our test environment, because it was a proof of concept, and we wanted to see if it works. If it works, we got a community, and we can keep going with it. If it didn't work, we were going to turn it off. Uh, so all of these turned into a couple of week efforts, and they would have been major budget items that probably multi-year efforts in previous regimes. So this project you're talking about is the Trade Information Warehouse, right? Right. So that's obviously something that's um, very transformative for the, obviously DTCC, but also the industry itself. Any advice for the audience on how you tackle a project like that? How do you look at something that, that's going to be transformative for your organization and actually begin to carry that through? Because I can't imagine that internally uh, that it was that easy to, to say, oh, we're going to do it this way and we're going we're gonna to make these things happen. This project is one of those where the stars completely aligned. We had a mainframe system that was old. It already had a replacement budget. We were already trying to figure out, you know, would we just replace the whole thing on the cloud with Oracle? We were looking at a variety of solutions, but there was already a business case to replace the system. We had a very um, uh, enthusiastic industry community that wanted to try out distributed ledger, but wanted to try it out on one specific use case. Because if everybody is trying out distributed ledger in their own use cases, then you have distributed chaos. You don't really have distributed ledger. Uh, so having a single model, a, an entire community, and a business case, uh, it, was, it was literally the, the perfect alignment of the stars that said, you know, here's uh, an opportunity, here's the budget, here's the progression, here's a business that's already predefined, so all you're really doing is moving it to a new technology platform. Uh, and it's progressing because we have that full buy-in. And it hit bumps in the road, uh, like every project hits, hits bumps, 
but the community was, was committed. So um, to say I could translate that into advice uh, that might carry to almost any other project is a bit of a challenge because distributed ledger is being you know, used as a hammer and every business problem is a nail. Uh, and, and that's not necessarily the case, but I think that's, that belongs in a different open stage. Oh, uh, there is a blockchain <laughs> open stage. You want to say something in response Yeah, to I was just going to say that, you know, one of the things the cloud fosters is a real culture of experimentation and it, and it democratizes access to high performance um, computing power. You know, in the past, if you had to invest massive uh, capex spend to stand up a big environment to do a project, it's very challenging. Now you've got so many, um, I guess, maybe more lower level organization or lower level teams within organizations who are empowered to just get up and experiment and try things out. So we've got customers who have, you know, um, multiple projects in flight simultaneously. Um, one in particular I can think of where people wanted to try out um, simulating some trade scenarios across um, hundreds of thousands of curves and surfaces. You can't do that without um, a, a very significant investment in compute spend. Um, with cloud, you can try it out. You can get going, prove an idea, prove a concept. Just get going, right? Start consuming data, start proving the idea, and you come out with tangible, real-world benefits rather than just writing a, a white paper about what uh, the payoff might be. So I'm glad you mentioned culture because uh, I recently had a conversation with one of our customers uh, and they said, when we started our, our journey to the cloud, we thought it was going to be 70% technology uh, and 30% people and culture, and we were 100% wrong. It's actually the reverse. It's about 30% technology and technological change, and 70% people and process and philosophy and practice change. Would love your guys' perspective on, on how that's worked in your own organizations and how you've seen your organization's ability to actually change the way that you do business. Any, any insights there? Yeah, I, I think all right, it's, the cloud starts with this model that you're just going to get compute through the internet. You don't have to buy servers. So you go, all right, who's going to be upset? The people who unpack the shipping boxes and rack the servers, but everyone else will be OK. Then you realize, and this is kind of the aha moment, that everything in the infrastructure is software. Everything you provision, everything you deprovision is software. And everything can be automated in a way that configurations are automated, um, provisioning is automated, deprovisioning is automated. Everything can be turned into scripts. And that's where you really start crossing the boundary and, and I don't know how everyone else's organizations deal with their infrastructure, but lovingly handcrafted is a phrase that was very common inside of DTCC. Uh, we had infrastructure teams that would lovingly handcraft the server, craft the firewall rules, put together the Lego blocks, and be very proud of, of their implementation. And every implementation looked completely different than any previous implementation. So it was really, it was always challenging to get standards, but the explanation was, well, the business wanted a custom solution, so we just, you know, accommodated the business requirements. Having an ecosystem where everything's software, you can put everything in your CI, CD pipeline, configuration management in that pipeline, and basically change the whole model, where now your infrastructure team has to think in terms of pipeline and have to think in terms of versioning everything they do, massive. And, and we're, we're still working through that. Any insights? Yeah, I mean, maybe not specifically uh, on the Refinitiv side. I think um, it's easy also to fall into um, a view that, you know, everything can move to the cloud and it's fit for purpose for every use case. The trick is identifying the, the many, many use cases where um, it's a no-brainer. Um, and I think most organizations out there, if we're honest, and the show of hands that we saw earlier um, indicates that there is a ton of stuff that can still be done um, where uh, 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 processing is moved to the cloud. You know, I think amongst our customer base, something like 60% of, um, uh, of operations that are back office operations have already been moved to uh, the cloud. But culturally, to your question, I think the view is 
Okay, well, that, we've got to stop there because maybe we've got our cost take out. Um, the question is, okay, well, where can you push the envelope a bit and do more and do things differently? Um, I think there's also a cultural question around security. Um, you know, it's interesting that a year or two ago, it was the, uh, the, the sort of thing that people said, well, we can't move to the cloud because of security. Now we're seeing, I think, customers saying, well, actually, the amount of money that these cloud providers are pouring into security, um, perhaps you know they're doing it better than anyone else in the industry. So it's a reason to move to the cloud, not um, stay uh, on-prem. Um, but it still remains the number one concern when you ask people about, you know, why aren't you moving more culturally? What, what what's the barrier? People say, well, you know, we're worried about data privacy, worried about security. So it's a bit of a paradox there. I think it's interesting that, that that continues to be the number one concern, but I think that's probably just the number one concern in the industry, period. Not just with cloud, but in, in general, being able to uh, ensure the security and privacy of the data that we're entrusted with from a fiduciary responsibility. I mean, it, when, you, when you have a data center that is composed of lots of different machines from lots of different acquisitions, lots of different integrations, you end up with, with this environment that you cannot say was designed intentionally. So we, we've got this thing that's kind of strung together. Then you start looking at the cloud as a field of dreams where you can encrypt data at rest, in transit, uh, you can have a variety of different key management schemes that meet all your security criteria. Amazon has been very good in terms of dealing with uh, hard, hardware encryption encryption keys maintained on-prem, maintained in your shop, maintained in the cloud. Uh, and then going back to the automation point, if you can automate everything you do and put configuration and security policy into your automation pipeline, you don't need administrative access to machines. You can basically take away all the, the, the quote we use as fat finger, all the mistakes that people make because they accidentally left some something, they pressed, they put a configuration in accidentally wrong. You can, if you can test your configurations, put them into the pipeline like any other piece of software, then you have a whole different way of ensuring and enforcing your security models, which is completely different than most firms do on-prem. So, you know, in, in our perspective and, and how we talk about it and how we present it to our, our supervisor, our regulatory community, and our clients, the cloud allows you to achieve a, a level of security you, you can't even get to on-prem, you know, besides the fact that, you know, the cloud's business model is basically based on them being secure. Just what you can do in your own firm in terms of automa automating your environments is unachievable. And patches and releases and fixes the, uh, you know, gaps in the technology stack can be done. Well, pretty quick. I think you both very accurately pointed out that it's a learning process throughout the organization uh, from the standpoint of the boots on the ground developers and the infrastructure uh, teams all the way up through compliance and security and risk management all the way to the board of directors making sure that the organization itself understands this step change uh, both from a technological uh, and a security perspective as well. So uh, Bob, I want to go back to something you said. You talked about no-brainer use cases. And we touched on it a couple of times in the conversation. This entire uh, festival has touched on it quite a bit, but machine learning. And I'd love to get both of your perspectives on where the industry is in relation to machine learning um, and what we think the future holds uh, for machine learning. Um, and then maybe anything you want to you know, share about what you guys are looking at in relation to machine learning. But I want to do that after we take a poll from the audience. So again, show of hands. Who in the audience is working with machine learning today? So not quite half at this time. Probably about six folks if we're if we're uh, honest. Um, so starting from that basis, what are your viewpoints on machine learning in the industry? Well, I think it shows just um, first of all what a new frontier it still is in in many respects. But there are people out there doing real stuff. Right? It's not just experimentation. It's not just buzzwords that people are throwing around. There are very real projects that are leveraging uh, machine learning toolkits uh, to get more insight out of data and, and to automate processes. Now, um, from our perspective, and I'm going to say this because we're a data company, 
it all starts with data, right? You can't do machine learning if you don't have any data. So for us, it's about um, connecting the dots amongst multiple different data types and providing that data um, uh, with easy access through common APIs in an environment where you can also use resident machine learning toolkits. I, I, I don't know what use cases there are for um, uh, machine learning uh, supervised or other uh, on premise, but I'm imagining that most projects are going to, are going to require a huge amount of compute power um, to run through different simulations. And so um, I think it's very exciting. I think for the financial industry, we'll see use cases from risk management, um, compliance, uh, trade analysis, um, search and discovery of content, making it easier and more personalized for people to be targeted with the information that's relevant to them. Uh, a whole gamut of different use cases. DTCC comes with almost everything from a very risk-oriented perspective. Uh, and going back to the skeptical people in our traditional IT department, uh, we look at every technology um, from a very risk and somewhat skeptical perspective initially. And machine learning is a good example of something that vendors had painted a particular way. You buy this tool, you put your data into it, magic will happen. You will get these insights, suddenly these giant peaks will come up on these visual charts and you will know exactly where your problem is without even telling it what to look for. Uh, and it was complete crap. It, you know, it, it didn't bear any relationship. We, we threw some money away doing that. So, so not investing in data scientists, not investing in um, people who actually understand the data and understand what it means to teach the machine what to look for was problem number one. Problem number two is saying that everything is a potential thing that can be learned from. It's true, but if you have two data points a day, it'll take you about 50 years to accumulate enough data points for a machine to actually learn anything. So if you're trying to aim at something that you'll learn from, you need, to, to Bob's point, a lot of data. It's got to be enough data that you can actually find patterns in the data, and two data points a day is not going to get you there. We've recently had some success um, with, not surprisingly, customer support information. So customers calling, customers complaining where all their problems are, and being able to use machine learning to find the right articles in our knowledge database and bring them up to our customer support people to be able to have them be able to give quicker response to, to client, client questions. So we've, we've, we've found some opportunities to start learning from it and start small experiments so we could start training internal teams to, to have some better skills in that. Yeah, that's a really good insight. Thanks, guys. So I'm going to stay with you for a minute, Rob. Um, regulation always plays a big role in this industry's ability to transform itself. What do you think are the key things that firms need to address when communicating step changes in technology to regulatory bodies? You, you, ha you have a history um, and experience working with regulatory bodies around the world. What do organizations need to be able to communicate to their regulators when they talk about changes to their technological step? It, I mean, the, the goal of regulations is, is uh, investor protection. And, and you know, that it's important to, to, to always keep in mind that you know, the, the regulators are setting these thresholds for a purpose that is supposed to be your guideline and it's supposed to be you know, how to do the right thing. You know, the, the issue we've, we've had to address is that sometimes regulations actually prescribe hardware. Uh, so there, were, there was a period of time where regulations say you have to store data on optical platters. So moving to CDs or you know, the next set of media was problematic because it wasn't an optical platter. Okay? Then it was you had to have immutable hardware uh, that is just produced by a few vendors. So when we started talking about moving data to the cloud, there was a long journey we went through. We're partnering with Amazon to define their storage glacier as compliant with the uh, U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission rules that allows us to, to archive. Uh, so it's kind of gone down that path of, of working with our regulatory uh, supervisors on where the right threshold is. Uh, uh, some good examples are really around resiliency right now, uh, where we, we have 
uh, traditions of of specifying resiliency and testing resiliency in the regulation, but the testing of the resiliency says, all right, close a data center and go to another data center. Asking a cloud provider like Amazon to basically um, bother a million clients, oh, by the way, we're closing our data center because one client wanted us to close it, the other 990,000 uh, now have to suffer the consequences of us performing a test. Uh, that's not going to fly in the in the new model. So, working with with our supervisors on what is the right threshold to be able to test to regulations, where can policy objectives be set and made so that they're not directly requiring certain hardware, uh, and probably the most challenging is uh, and and the most un, unanswered at this point uh, is is trying to find some kind of harmony uh, globally because uh, if you're working with global data and trades and transactions that cross global borders, uh, you're dealing with different regulatory requirements and different jurisdictions might have different privacy requirements, different tax regimes, uh, different, you have to have this on-premises in this country or you're allowed to move into different places. So I'll say it's, it, it's, a continuous dialogue and it's a strong partnership and it's a work in progress. Bob, you guys work with, with, with customers that are based around the world. That obviously comes with uh, global regulatory expectations. Anything you guys are seeing in this regard? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just important for call for clear demarcation over um, you know, what data you're worried about, right? So market data services, price information, news, sentiment, fundamentals, all this type of data is already in the cloud, it's already been, been distributed everywhere, and people end up in all sorts of rabbit holes about concerns over those content sets. Obviously what the regulators are worried about are uh, client data, um, personal information, transactions content that's not obfuscated. So um, huge amounts of work going into digitizing that and, and making those um, uh, anonymizing data in the cloud um, is very, very important. Uh, I just sometimes worry about um, maybe misinformed decisions that, that get made based on a perception of what the regulator wants rather than uh, what the regulator is actually saying. So honest communication uh, with your regulator about what your intentions are, it sounds like, uh, are, are, are the rules of the day, if you will, for success. We've only got about a minute left. Uh, I want to close by asking you the question. It's not necessarily cloud related, uh, but since we are uh, talking about FinTech this week, um, and when people think about fintech, they tend to think about the future, the future, the future, the future. Come on. Again, the budget was really light for this. We didn't have the Rocky music, we didn't have the echoes, I had to do it myself. Um, but when you think about fintech, people tend to think about the future and not necessarily the present. So let's look to the future for a minute. What do you, what do you guys think the future of the industry looks like? Let's go up five years from now. Five years from now, what is this industry going to look like as we continue to evolve the way we use technology? Well, again, I'm, I'm going to provide a very data-biased answer, but um, I think the information industry has already undergone colossal change in the last few years. If you look out um, years into the future, I think the, the work that goes into managing data, collecting data, scrubbing data, cleaning data, a lot of that is going to go away. Our customers are calling for solutions that enable them to federate data from any source, anywhere in the world, at any time, in real time, whether it's coming from a supplier like us, or the public domain, or social media, or a regulator, or internal data, whether it's structured or whether it's unstructured. So I see cloud playing a pivotal role in providing the platforms to help aggregate um, and, and integrate those types of data. Um, so that's a, a very data answer. But, uh, I, I, I just think, like, if I think back five years, would we be, would I be, you know, thinking I'd be in a, a fintech festival like this in Singapore? Uh, would distributed ledger be even a conversation? Uh, you know, I, the amount of change that's going on now and what uh, generational evolution or revolution is going on between cloud, automation, data, including AI, machine learning, robotics, and uh, distributed ledger, and the convergence of all of those, there's going to be some kind of killer sets of apps 
you could picture an industry 20 years from now with robo-advisors, uh, automated sifting through data, all of this running in the cloud, the, the amount of, the, the number, the need for on-premises data center 20, 10, 20 years from now is probably very questionable. Uh, there's, there's probably some aspects that, that may still require some on-premises data center, but probably if you have that on-premises data center, it will need to be buried 10 miles underneath in a mine shaft because it is the ultimate exit strategy that you have to keep. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the machine learning will be the, the amount of, of avatars uh, and I'll say automatic greeters, automated greeters that I'm seeing on different screens here, even in the Amazon booth. What's her name? Uh, Christine. Christine. Couldn't be a guy. Well, could be. <laughs> uh, I, I can't even predict. It's going to be, it's a great ride. Well, I think it will be a great ride. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens, um, just as I'm sure all of you are. With that, we want to thank you for being in the audience today. Now, please help me thank both Rob and Bob uh, for the engaging conversation. Thanks, guys.